Our next speaker, her professional roots are in test lead. She has now shifted uh, towards test automation and I love the reasoning. The reasoning being because it's so much fun. So we'll hear about fun stuff. Let's welcome on the stage from Stockholm, Kristina Sapotik. Yesterday, uh, my colleague Elias and I hosted a workshop uh, and uh, we did the workshop by giving the participants a challenge uh, to uh, try to uh, automate a long flow. Uh, so this was the test flow that we gave them, uh, but with a bit more detail. Uh, but the, the core of the challenge was to navigate your way over uh, different interfaces. So this was the, the different interfaces that were included. And these were the libraries that we suggested that they would use to solve the problem. Uh, and uh, this Odin library here, it's, it's uh, our own uh, image recognition and, and keyboard emulating library, which I won't go further into because we haven't uh, released it yet, but it's coming. Um, but, well, it was sort of a whimsical challenge but it does reflect how we are working with our customers. Uh, and uh, uh, for, for uh, um, this presentation, I will um, try to give you an, an insight of uh, uh, working with robot framework in, in uh, not the most common situations. Um, my name is Christina Sabotic. Uh, I work with test automation and test leading uh, at Advisit, a Swedish consultant company. And I really enjoy working with them because I got such um, helpful and, and experienced colleagues to always turn to. Um, and we always find new challenges to dive at. Uh, it's, it's so much fun. <laughs> um, before that, I was a, a test leader, and a super short summary of me is that I live in Stockholm. Uh, I studied physics in Uppsala. I have a family with two kids, and if I ever get some time, uh, some spare time, I spend that on knitting. It's my favorite hobby. So. I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that most of you work with some sort of system development. Hands up if you do. Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, the customers that we work with don't do any development of their own. Uh, they are at the very end of the chain. The receivers, the end users. Uh, and. Well, in an ideal world, uh, they should be able to buy some software and start using it. But, uh, of course, that is not the case. Um, once the receiver uh, uh, receives uh, the software, there's still a tremendous amount of testing left to do. And there are five main reasons for this. First is the obvious one of faulty software sort of depending on how reliable the supplier is. And then the configurations need to be tested. And a large ERP system like the one I'm working with will literally have billions of uh, parameter com combinations. So it's quite easy to find one um, combination that the supplier haven't already tested. And sometimes you, or often, you run into combinations that they didn't even intend would work. Uh, and on uh, uh, standard systems, it's uh, very common to, to place some custom modifications on top, uh, which uh, are generally made by another supplier. Uh, so these modifications will trigger more test scenarios for, for uh, the system. But since they are their own delivery, 
they, would all, they will also be subject to uh, the points that are listed here. Uh, and then the bot software must integrate correctly with all the surrounding systems. And since these uh, integrations must be up and running at all production hours, uh, this is where we put uh, the most effort in automation. And uh, then there is the whole system behavior, which is absolutely unique uh, for, for each customer. And curious things tend to happen when you put uh, different modules to work together that are produced by different suppliers, written in different languages, have different interfaces, and are quite possibly produced during different decades. And since we focus on or uh, work with end-to-end -end tests, we, we cover both integration and whole system behavior. And a few years back, I, uh, I did the ISTQB certification. And, and um, uh, today, on a, or on a daily basis, I am Googling my way around problem solving. I guess most of you are as well. And in both those uh, cases, I am so genuinely surprised that um, testing for, for receiving end users is barely mentioned or not mentioned at all. Uh, so I wanted to, to put what we do into some sort of map. Uh, and I'm going to go all old school on you and bring up the V model. Uh, oh. Look, uh, the unit testing ended up in Mordor. <laughs> uh, it, it is a complete coincidence, but maybe, maybe it means something around, like, you cannot simply implement unit tests on legacy code. That was my one joke. Now I'm not going to be this awkward again. Uh, <laughs> but let's focus on the user acceptance testing. Uh, let's see where I am. Uh, the user acceptance testing is completely focused on getting the product ready for release. Uh, you test the user stories that comes from credible personas based on, on um, uh, the customers. You do usability testing. You might put together a focus group of actual customers. And, and uh, you uh, try to get as good coverage as possible by uh, mapping your path through uh, a business process model, and so on. In short, pre-release testing. And then you have the release. And uh, then you will find me somewhere out here in the wasteland <laughs> after the release. And, and uh, for lack of a better phrase, I'm just calling this receiving user acceptance testing. So what's the difference? It's a shift of focus. Uh, it shifts from uh, what does our customers want to what do I want, and does all our cool features work to well, can I do those things that I need? And uh, in general, it's a shift of focus from one supplier with many customers to uh, one receiver with a specific agenda uh, and uh, a specific process to follow. And of course, I can use a lot of the experience that I've gained from software development uh, and apply it in this situation. But I just wanted to, to bring some attention to how underdocumented this area is. And also, I wanted to request that if someone has tips on uh, books on this or blogs, uh, that focus on on this testing, please come talk to me afterwards, because uh, I would be really glad to hear that. So in the last year, um, I have been working with a wholesale uh, customer. 
Uh, they have a large central warehouse in Sweden uh, from which they deliver uh, to their customers, but also to their 60-something stores that are spread around the country, and they can reach it uh, on a daily basis for restocking. And they needed to upgrade their ERP system. Uh, and this upgrade, it took a one and a half year project with up to 90 participants to, to um, get through. And I've been involved in this first with, with some test automation and uh, uh, then I, uh, in the last half year, I've been uh, working with it as a test leader doing mainly manual testing uh, or organizing the manual testing at least. Um, and in my opinion, we did way too much of the manual testing. And the next time this customer needs to do uh, another major upgrade, they will be able to cut down uh, on this uh, manual testing consider considerably. Um, but I'm going to describe one type of testing that we could decrease uh, uh, a lot during the project, and that's the end-to-end -end testing. Uh, so, at this particular customer, uh, they have um, documented around 30 very long process flows that goes a little bit uh, across the, the organization, and in essence, it covers their whole business. But uh, the, these process flows are just very highly documented. Um, or high level documented, uh, and they are run uh, not often enough because they are so uh, expensive and uh, complicated to organize. Um, like many of our customers, uh, they don't have their own uh, test organization that will oversee the whole solution. And when these tests are run, um, you need to call in uh, different pe uh, people from different parts of the organization who are not testers by profession. They need to put their normal duties aside to do this testing, and uh, none of them will know the entire flow. Uh, so everybody must contribute with their part. Yeah. And this is just an example from this particular customer. What we're more used to is uh, that there are no uh, long processes documented at all. Uh, and instead, uh, uh, you find regression tests that are uh, on very varying level of documentation and you need to put together and try to draw up the full picture. Um, so, what does uh, these test flows look like? Well, this is one test case that, uh, or a test flow that we've automated, one of many, and it's an extremely simplified version of their inbound flow. Uh, it starts in the ERP system. Uh, someone creates and processes a purchase order, uh, which ends up in the supplier portal. Um, both the ERP system and the supplier portal are reached through uh, web interfaces. Um, so the order is further processed, and you will get an order confirmation that is a PDF file. In this case, we just save a screenshot of, the f of it for, for each uh, test run. Then back to the ERP system uh, to check that the statuses have been correct. Uh, so in the background, we will run a database check to see that everything has been entered correctly there, because uh, not everything is, uh, is shown on screen. Uh, and then uh, the items uh, end up in the warehouse. Uh, so uh, 
uh, the foreman or one foreman at the warehouse will uh, use a desktop interface for, for the warehouse management system to receive the goods. And then someone wants, needs to store the items uh, with a forklift. And they have uh, tablets mounted in the forklift. So they, we will uh, run our script um, through that interface. And finally, finance. Uh, receiving, the, oh, receiving the invoice, uh, which is re reached through a web archive, but it's a PDF file. So again, we, we uh, save a screen, screenshot of it, but we also want to verify the content. So we need to read the, the PDF as well. And when this is run, we have, uh, we have uh, been in contact with five different interfaces, and we have replaced seven manual testers. In our projects, we have uh, decided to uh, almost exclusively uh, test from the user interface. And the reason for that is that it is so pedagogical. Um, it gives a larger part of the organization uh, a chance to understand what the tests really do, as the tests are performing exactly the same steps as a human would do. And when something goes wrong, uh, they can follow uh, what has been done step by step on the screen. And uh, uh, smart feature that we've added is uh, that when a test case fails, uh, it doesn't only take a snapshot of the system under test. Uh, it also uh, goes in and checks the status of the integration engine and the message broker, so that the one who who's doing the troubleshooting uh, will um, immediately get a hint if if it's an environmental problem or if it's a functional problem and uh, well to to throw some buzzwords around we are creating some uh, post release uh, um, shift left we identify the problems earlier and most of all we can point towards which system is causing the problem and uh, which supplier to contact And we always aim to write easy to read test cases so that anyone in the organization can, can read it and understand what the test does. Uh, it, it would be really miserable for us if, if what we did, what we're doing there uh, is consider, considered too complicated or incomprehensible. Uh, and it, we certainly do gain more business if other parts of the organization can, can see the benefit of what we've started uh, working with. And when we make these uh, long flows, we, of course, start with the happiest of happy paths uh, by uh, identifying uh, the customer's most common, most important uh, process flows. And then, uh, once that is working, we start adding deviations uh, by trying to find out what usually causes problems for them and uh, what can be tricky. And I know that long process flows are often frowned upon because uh, they are uh, high maintenance and uh, tend to be unstable. But we have put a lot of effort into uh, making our tests uh, more stable. And, uh, uh, the findings uh, for, for this uh, can be uh, divided into two sections, uh, doing smart image recognition and avoiding the pitfalls. And, well, image recognition is a part, a large part of our tests, whether we like it or not. Uh, and one thing that we have done to uh, uh, enhance the uh, accuracy of this uh, is uh, to use uh, 
uh, two different image recognition libraries. So if the first one fails, uh, the test won't fail, but it will fall back on the second uh, library and give that a shot before uh, reporting a fail. So in our case, we first use this, uh, well, our own uh, image recognition library because it's uh, really quick and simple. And if that fails, we fall back on the Sikuli library. Uh, and by uh, always aiming to use fewer keywords that can do more, um, and putting a lot of uh, the logic into which test data we're using, uh, we have been able to simplify the maintenance uh, a lot, and uh, it has made us better at not repeating ourselves. Uh, we're really good at documenting uh, the right stuff. Um, for example, um, we have meticulous, uh, meticulously detailed documentation for our test environment uh, down to well, screen resolution and what background image you have to have and color codes and so on. Um, this really helps in onboarding new developers uh, and uh, it's also much easier to reset the test environment if anything should happen to it. Uh, and when we take screen captures, we make them as small as possible because um, the image recognition, it goes faster and it's more accurate. And um, most of all, it gives a little bit of wiggle space for uh, redesigns and upgrades. And this <laughs> might be counterintuitive, but uh, it is a good idea to avoid image recognition whenever you can. If there is another way around, uh, like using keyboard keyboard uh, commands, or uh, uh, in our case, doing some uh, database checks in the background, and it's still pedagogical because if anyone is viewing the test, uh, they will see things they recognize on the screen, and they won't know that we are getting our test data from the database instead. And the last point, uh, <laughs> a little bit tough to uh, summarize, but after a while you get, gain some experience of uh, what are good images and what aren't. Um, just to make sure I got everything here. Uh, so you gain some experience of well, what's smart and what's not, and uh, what is likely to change, and uh, what sort of images that might already exist. Uh, for example, not having two similar pictures of the same button in different places in the system. Uh, so, well, the images, they are just like the coding. Don't repeat yourself. And in short, this is basically how we are using uh, robot framework, and um, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed um, getting a sort of different point of view on this, uh, and uh, afterwards I would love to hear from you uh, if anyone is doing sort of the same or completely the op opposite, just come talk to me afterwards, uh, I would like that. That's it from me. Thank you. <laughs> So, questions for Christina? Here. I'll throw it. <laughs> Can you hear me? Great. Um, I have a question. Maybe you could tell a little bit more about the image recognition library that you use, this Odin library. I tried to Google it, uh, but I found some Odin library. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like I said in the beginning, it's not released yet. So, I, maybe I shouldn't even mention the name. It's coming. Uh, so, it's coming. Yeah. When? <laughs> I don't know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at Elias. He's the one who's made it. Uh, maybe, maybe he can. Okay. No, it's a no. secret, but he's the one. So. Uh, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> then, then a smaller question. Thank you for the answering. Um, 
how do you organize the images? Are they also part of the source code? I mean, um, committing also to the um, code management system? Yes. Yeah, we we uh, we store them in in the in the same place. So so in our folder structure, we have we have the uh, uh, the keywords and the images um, sort of in the same place. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and uh, it's part part of our version control. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Someone in the back? Yeah. We have a runner here. It's no fun anymore. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Uh, well, I was uh, trying to understand uh, when you are basically capturing the images, did you use some automation or you are manually capturing the images and storing it at a place and then comparing when you are running the scripts? Yes, we're manually capturing the images. Uh, so that, that is part of, the, of, the, of writing the scripts. OK. OK, thank you. Uh, but. Uh, you can also try to automate capturing of images. Uh, I have used it in one of my assignments using PyOro UI. So that's also a good idea to do. That sounds like a, a very good idea. I, I've heard a bit about it, but I haven't looked into that yet. So uh, that's something for 2020. OK, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Any more questions on there? Anywhere else? This okay. one, okay. yeah, well, Where? No. run. <laughs> <laughs> scared so of tripping fun. down the steps. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Careful. Good. Uh, you, you mentioned about uh, performance the same like a uh, human do. Uh, what about reputable uh, parts of application, for example, uh, login, uh, which is required for an action. Uh, are you doing it by uh, GUI as well, or in a different way? Uh, yes, we're, we're doing that by uh, GUI as well. And, and actually, uh, that was the first time I used image recognition, because the, I, I was writing scripts towards a web interface, um, but the login was a different sort of... Uh, pop up. <laughs> now you hear my techie talk. <laughs> uh, so uh, Selenium couldn't reach it. Uh, and uh, uh, so we had to, to make some image recognition just to be able to, to type in uh, the user ID and press OK. Uh, so we're, 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 we use what we need in different, uh, on different occasions. OK, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Thank you, Christina. Nice Thank you. talk. Let's